Right. Good, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. And thank you for those of you who joined us online. So before we before I start the, the presentation, I'd like to make a few comments. I would call it a disclaimer. Okay. So I've been I've been doing calligraphy um, consistently for about three years and five months, to be quite precise. And therefore, I'm not I'm not a master, I'm not a professional, but I just do it like everybody else does. So you will see how how you can you can experience doing calligraphy. So what I'm going to do uh, in this presentation is to give you some general ideas about how calligraphy works and how you could actually. Uh, Practice it personally uh, uh, in your in your in your own life. Uh, I don't know whether it's, it's it's a hobby or something that you really want to enjoy in your life. Uh, this is about the Nasaliq uh, uh, calligraphy. They call it Persian, but of course it includes the Arabic script as well. Now this guy on the right is Mizal Ansar Sani. He's one of the most prominent calligraphers of the Qajar period. He's my favorite guy. The one on the left is Siyamash by Mirza Ghulam Mirza, and that is a Verse by Nzari Bolistani. It happens to be, I discovered this quite later on. I didn't know that he'd used the verse by an Islamic poet. So uh, let's. Right. So the thing about this Nasali style that it, it is it is said to be the, the Naskh Ta'alib. So it's a kind of a an, an alteration of the Naskh script. The Naskh script is. is is, is very much about, about uh, straight lines with sharp edges. So it is, it is an evolution of that, that, of that Nasq script. Now, the Nasq is, is about these sharp lines. And of course there are curves in it, but not in, to the extent that you have it in the Nasalib uh, uh, straight uh, script as, we, as we're gonna see it shortly. Now, this is what they what, what they use for it. They they call it ta'alik because it's about hanging some something which is hanging. So imagine those straight lines hanging. Imagine it like a hair, and the hair if you keep it hanging, it just does a curve in it. It, it becomes curly, and which is why they call it nasq ta'alik. It's hanging. It's suspending nasq, and therefore that that those those. Uh, curves which are added to it make it a little bit more beautiful. So when we talk about nasalik, it is not just about an art, it is more than an art. What you do with nasalik is that uh, you need to spend time on it. It takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of passion as well. You need to really give your heart to it. And as a result, it is not just, well, they would tell you that any kind of art is like this, but there is something more specific about nasalik because of the subject of what you do, because of the connection it has with a number of various disciplines, and uh, particularly in, in, in the Persian language, that it makes it very specific and very peculiar. So mentally and physically, you need to discipline yourself. It's not just the physique of your hand and your body, the way you write, the way you train your hand, but it's also got to do with your mentality. In a sense, it is something like a meditation. You need to spend time on it. And it, by, by time, I don't mean hours and hours of just doing it. Of course, it is required. But sometimes when you train yourself to just spend three minutes, four minutes, five minutes a day on this, gradually over time, you would see how it pays off. Now, in this sense, I call it, there is a spiritual element to it because you need to focus on it mentally and then you train yourself. Now, when you do the calligraphy, your body posture is very, very much important. I mean, in the, in the, in the old times, the predecessors used to actually have their, uh, the thing that the mat, and then they would. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's it's just, perfect. Thank you. They would, they would use the mat and they would sit down and they would do it on their knee. So, but they didn't have a table at that time. So they would have to just squat and do it. And kind of posture was difficult and they would get, they need to get used to it. Now people usually do it on, on a table. And it, it helps your, your body posture. You need to really train yourself and your breathing is very much important, particularly when we get to the elongations, when you get to the mat and the kashida, you need to be able to hold your breath properly. So it is, it is in a sense, a, a kind of a spiritual practice. Those people who do their zikr in the morning, they, they know that this is something closely related to that one. You need to be able to control your breathing as well. So the angle of your hands play a part and you will see uh, that that also is interconnected with the way you are, you're actually carving your pen, making it ready for, for uh, uh, doing the, the practice of the, the, the mashq of, of, of calligraphy. So it is, 
in this sense, connected to how human beings are perfecting themselves. That is why I call it, it is, it is something spiritual. This is, uh, this is my reading of it. Of course, there are people who would completely disagree with me. I would call it some kind of a mystical practice because it helps you work on yourself. Now, when we talk about the Nasalic language, people would ask, okay, I don't know Persian, I don't know Arabic. It is, language is important, but that's not the whole thing. Because specifically when we talk about the Nasali, it is more about graphics. It's more about aesthetics. It's more about how uh, you, you enjoy it. So uh, language helps, it's important, but at the end of the day, it's about the pleasure of being able to do it and being able to present it to people. So when you look at the a, a Nasali script, you would, anybody, would, even if the people who don't know the language, would, would feel something. Which, which resonates with their feelings. So uh, what we deal with, it shapes and angles and curves at a very cursory level. So if you don't know the language, that's not a big problem. All you need is to be able to handle the dots and the lines and the curves. These are the three basic things that you will be able to deal with when you, when you do that style. So the next one, of course, is getting the proportions right. And again, it, is, it, it has nothing to do with knowing the language or with knowing the script. It is about geometry. It is about how you're, that your brain works, it is about how your eye works. If you train your eyes and train your hands, and there's a, there's a syn synchronization between your hands and your eyes and your brain, and therefore you put it on the on balance. So all of this is achieved by uh, spending time on it. You need patience, you need, you need practice, and you need perseverance. It just takes time. It doesn't take millions of years. Um, it, you, you can do it in months and get ready for it, but then uh, it's, it's important to really know that this just doesn't happen overnight. You cannot do it for a week and then leave it for three years and then come back. I, this is what I did. I, I started practicing calligraphy again after over 30 years. And I, I had teachers when I was a kid and then I started doing it on my own. And you'll see how problematic that was until I started taking direct lessons from the teacher. It, it plays a very important part. So when we talk about calligraphy, particularly in the, in the Persian culture, there is an interconnection between calligraphy and different forms of art. So if you uh, think about the, the domain of Persian calligraphy, that it's not just about nastalik, it's also about other signs of, of calligraphy. It includes illumination, which is ta'zib, and you would see it around the building. You see some examples of this in, in, in the building where we work, and you've got book, book binding uh, arts, you've got paper tinting, pigment making, uh, historiated painting, which is a tashkir, sorry, that S is SH. Now, it's not just, I write a piece of uh, uh, calligraphy, and then you've got another artist who's adding illumination to it, who's adding tashkir to it, who's adding all kinds of things, and then it becomes a book, it becomes an album. So what you have is that you have the text, then you have the calligrapher, and that calligrapher is, of course, it, you would have to start doing your uh, carving your knife, you would have to prepare your ink, you would have to do everything about the tools that you need, and then you hand it over to somebody who is an expert in, in, in illumination, and then it goes all the way, to, it becomes an industry, if you like. It's not just a simple task. It involves a great many people into it, and it becomes part of culture. Therefore, it is, it is highly uh, characteristic of what we call a a genre of humanism, the way that George Mardisi would refer to it. It's, this is called humanism. Now, they are, of course, closely connected with books, how, how they are produced over centuries. And the, the, the uh, culture of writing books is something very deeply uh, ingrained in the mentality of Muslims in particular. So they've evolved over centuries and they keep evolving. Now, I'm going to talk about some of the tools that we've got. That, that one is a, I think it's, it's, uh, a, 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 the things that Mir Ali Rabi, one of the famous calligraphers of, of previous centuries, has written. It says, that nice calligraphy is, 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 is pleasant. It is just so, soul and the spirit in the body of the young and the old. So it, you, can, you can feel how, how these people are making connections. With it. So the basic tools that you need is, of course, the paper, the parchment, obviously. But the right kind of paper is critical. There is a siyamash by Mirza Olam. It's like he used to just keep uh, uh, scribbling these things. And it is, you, when you look at it, you think, well, it's a piece of art. But when you read it closely, he says that it's just talking. He says, this fellow uh, in, in, in the market that I go into to, to receive the papers from him, he's just producing papers for me. And he's giving me bricks. He has no clue what he's giving to me. And he's making fun of the guy who's in, in, in his art. <laughs> and then you've got the pens. And which are the reeds or the bamboos, and you need to properly carve them, and then you need to finally uh, uh, 
to do a proper sanding of the of the of the pads. Then you've got the ink. Obviously, you cannot write without an ink unless you want to write with your blood, which is which is very very radical. Some people have actually done it. So this is usually produced. Uh, the ink is produced traditionally, and it's made of soot and things like that. But they also produced it industrially. You've got the inkwell to pour the ink in to keep it, and then you've got a wadding or the lira. These are just fine uh, threads of silk because it keeps the ink together. And you don't, but when you're just putting your pen into the ink, uh, well, it doesn't make it too soggy. So you need to just take sufficient amount of uh, uh, ink to, to be able to start writing. Then you've got now, this is something which comes at a later stage. You've got the pure distilled water. You never use undiluted uh, ink. Uh, you just if you do it, you're going to spend a lot of ink and it's going to cost you a lot of money. Then you could just, with a few drops of, of, of proper ink, you could last for months and you just need distilled water. So traditionally, uh, they use rose water, not the kind of rose water that you find in Waitrose, because that is mixed with oil and all kinds of perfumes. It's pure water, distilled water. You need to just dilute it. Then we've got something which is called Arabic sand, but some kind of a sticky glue-like thing which just holds the ink together so that it doesn't just spill over on the, on the paper when you start working on it. So, move this one back. So there, there's this thing which is called the mat of the padding that you hold underneath your hand when you write. So uh, when you're doing the calligraphy, you need something soft underneath it. If you just put it on a, on, on, on a table like this, which is really tough, it, it doesn't help very much. You can do it, but it, the quality would be fundamentally different. So going back to the paper or the parchment, what they used to do in the past is that they, they produced the paper using starching the paper. You can do it now. I mean, after a while, I mean, you don't have to always buy the paper. You could all these, get these papers that you find in the wrappings that you find. If you order something from Amazon, all those papers that you find in Amazon, that you're filling in, you can use all of them, starch them, which is, which is very, very economical. And then it'll, it'll produce the kind of paper that you need and you could last for months and for years actually with that kind of a starch paper. But not everybody has got the patient. You've got to have the space and you've got to dry them at home. And I don't think a professional person would actually be able to do it unless the person really loves it. Then we've got the handmade marble paper, paper which is the Aprobot paper. And I mean, in the past, what they used to do is that they used to mix uh, uh, yogurt and then uh, they would add different kinds of things and pigments on it. And then they would spread it in the paper and it would create the marble paper. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of it now. Now, the kind of paper that you choose to use depends on the taste that you have and depends on how, how professional you are and the kind of ink that you use. I mean, there are kinds of uh, a hard paper, the, the, the one which I mentioned earlier. It's not easy for everybody to, to, to write with them because they, they, it, they tends, sometimes it becomes very muddy and it, it takes some time until you really realize to do it. But once you really get the hang of it to work with the AHAR paper, it is something that you'll never go back to ordinary professional uh, industrialized kind of paper. So for the beginners, you need gloss paper, the thing that you could order, things that you could print on. And it helps very much because it doesn't really give you a hard time to do the practice. Then you've got the pen. And these are carved out of, out of reed, mostly. And uh, sometimes they're carved out of wood and they are sharpened by hand. And it's, 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 it's itself an art uh, on itself. So what you need is a professional pen knife, something like this. And this is not just an ordinary, ordinary thing. Uh, you cannot use a, a kitchen knife. It has to be a straight line. It has to be a very strong uh, steel uh, uh, blade so that it, it actually helps the, the, the carving. They call it Dalan Karosh. So one of the funny things that I did when I started calligraphy after a very long time is that I was, I was carving my pens with kitchen knife. Of course, it was very dangerous and I cut myself several times. I even did that with a, with a, with a, with a cutter, these, these long, thin, thin cutters, which is very dangerous, you must avoid it at all costs. You wouldn't have to do it because uh, your, your teacher would usually do the carving for you, but later on you would you'll be able to buy that kind of pen knife and then learn how to do it. You could spend days and months learning how to do the carving and you would never give it up because it's such a pleasurable thing <laughs> when you start the carving thing. I, you can't imagine how many pens I have and how many pens I've got. God, I do it regularly. <laughs> it sounds funny. <laughs> and you want too much time on your hands. <laughs> it doesn't, and you don't have too much time. You, you can do it in two minutes and five minutes. You just. <laughs> yeah. So it is, of course, it is, it is part of the art. The way you, you, you carve the knife, it becomes really, really uh, uh, 
a, a pleasurable thing. So there are techniques for it. And uh, not everybody has to learn it because there are people who do it. But over time, you will learn to do it yourself. But this is the key point. This is the response to your question. We sharpen them sparingly, unless you really want to learn how to do the carving. It's a very critical point that in previous times or the great masters of calligraphy, they say you just carve your pens very sparingly. If something fundamentally goes wrong with it, that's when you, you've got to stick to it the way you do. Take care of it, don't destroy it, and then, and then you'll start working. So the ink traditionally is made of soot. They've got walnut skin, they've got saffron, they've got, depending on the kind of colors they want to produce. So this is what they traditionally did. In professional industries, they now, I mean, if you go to Amazon, different stores, you find these are Daisu one or Sumi calligraphy liquid ink, which is a Japanese one. And you've got the German Schmenke, uh, 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 ink, which is an acrylic one, and it, it's it's very uh, shiny, if you like. It's 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 very good, particularly when you're using it on a hard paper. It it sticks very well. But I would I would always stick go back to the traditional ink, which is made of soot, which is very much important to to develop the skills. And as I said, all of them require dilution. The traditional ones always require dilution. You cannot just use them in in in, in plain format. So the ink well, the, the, the sizes are different, but they shouldn't be too deep. First of all, they should be airtight if you don't want your ink to really get dry very quickly. And your pen should be able to reach it easily without uh, having to just dip it too deep into it. I mean, the, the things that I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some of them, you'll see how easily accessible they are to the, to the nib of your pen. So the key thing is size, the shape, and the functionality of the ink well, not the ornaments on the sides of it. Now, one of the things that you could easily do is that all these um, <coughs> cosmetic jars that women use, you could always recycle them. That's what I do. You see all of these things, they belong to my wife. It's not just me. So that's a role that, <laughs> that women unintentionally play in <laughs> these days. So the wadding, these, these silk papers, uh, uh, you, you put them together so that they, your, your, your uh, ink doesn't, your, your pen doesn't get too soggy. And usually a thin layer of ink is sufficient. What you do, uh, uh, you, you uh, for shorter letters, you don't take too much uh, ink when you just dip it in, but for, when you're doing the elongation, you take a little bit more uh, so that it, it just lasts until you just pull the, uh, just complete the line. This is what you do with the kashida with the mat. Now, uh, I just went through this one. So what you need to do is really manage the amount of ink on the pen. This, this is very difficult. It takes time to realize how much you do it. But sometimes when you just take the ink, you don't just put it back. You, what I do is that I would do it on the back of my, on my thumb and so I just take it off. And you could see how it works. It's really helpful then. Then you've got the, 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 the mat. This is what I've done. It's usually made of, uh, it's usually made of uh, leather. So you keep it underneath and just, just forget about the paper. So you need something like this to, it's, it's soft. So you can you will feel it at the moment. If you just compare it with writing on a table and doing it on a mat, you would see the difference, how it helps. With, uh, with, the, with the writing. So uh, the flexibility is important. Now, the tools that you need for preparing the pens are, uh, are of course, uh, very interesting. Now, that one is also a, this is a Katiba by Mirza Ghulam again. Now, I'll, I'll go through and explain the, the different styles of the scripts. As, so this is one of them. So up there is a line, and then down there is this kind of a, uh, there are different kinds of prayers which are, which are described there. Now, you've got different kinds of pens. You've got the pens made of bamboo. Some pen, pens are made of, of, of wood. And some pens are made of reed. And uh, the, the sturdiness of the pen is really important. Sometimes the, the kind of pens that we find in Iran, which are, which are called the Desfuli pens, which are only found in the south of Iran and the southwest of Iran, uh, they're they're very they're very soft, so they don't last very long. They're, they're thin one. They're very dark color, the brownish dark color. Now, uh, the texture of the pen really needs to be stirred. So you could you could work uh, for a longer period with, with the pen that you've got. Now, what you need for the nibbling of the pen when you do the carving, you of course need the pen. Then you've got the pen knife, which is made of skin. Then you've got the nibbling block. Which is which is they call it the katsan. Now this needs to be usually it's made of 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 uh, uh, horn or wood. 
uh, tree with this either one knot or the kind of the tree of and not what is and not in English and not I don't know the word. So this is what you need to do the nibbling of, of the when you uh, complete the the, the uh, uh, carving. Then you need the sandpaper to just remove the sharp edges once you do the cutting with the with the pencil with, with the pen, which is really important to to get get it right because if you don't do that, then your your ink will just spread all over and it's, you, it, you will see how nasty it will look. And of course, this is not for beginners. You, this is just the details that you need to 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 work with. So if you look at the different styles of Nasali calligraphy and what they look like, this one is very clearly shows the difference between the Nas. This one, the one on the left is the Nas. You see how straight the lines are. This one is Nasali. It's a very early Nasali. I think this is from the 16th century. It's evolved. We've changed many of these. The, the way we write the letters have changed slightly, but you could see how different the curves are, how the elongations, you, you see the the depth of, of, of certain letters. You see, this is what they see in the work they have. It's so some kind of like, it's like a bed that you lie down on it. And it, it's, there's a, they call it abhor. It's a place where you could, you could put a drop, drop of water and it could hold it like this, just like a vessel or a cup. Now this one is called the sat. So you just write one single line. And, and it's the, the sat is always used to teach students because that's where you start. That's where you begin. You gradually, you master this one. Then they've got at, at a at a higher level they've got the chalipa. The chalipa is, is basically four lines, and this is exactly how they are, they are, they are done. This is done by Mir Ali Salam and Salam by Mir Salam by It's a very old uh, uh, prayer which is used in many different Muslim communities. So the chalipa is, is only four lines, but the, the way the way you shape them is is the, these two lines are in the same line. So this one is is aligned with this one, and this one is aligned with the fourth part of the line. Uh, I could probably give you a different image to show that one, but that covers it. The other thing is the Siyah Mashk. Now, the Siyah Mashk is basically not written to be exactly legible at first sight. You cannot figure it out exactly. It takes some time until you find out what is written over it. It's about the beauty of it. It's about the aesthetics of it. When you go to the higher degree, then you will learn how to put them together and you could write words on, onto one another. That one, that Mirza, this is by Mirza Ola Mirza. Uh, this, this is the thing, this, the thing that he does at the bottom of it is this sentence is Ya Ali Madad Ast. Or this is the signature of Mirza Ola Mirza. Where you, wherever you see a, a calligraphy by him, he just signs uh, his name and then there's a small uh, signature of Ya Ali Madad Ast, which is part of his writing. And this is a verse by Hafiz, Maqam Aslima, Kushay Khalabat Ast, Khudar Khayb, Dahadan Kirki Namarat. So the other one is Kitabat. Now this is very thick. Kitabat is, it looks very much like the Chalipa, but it's different. Chalipa is four lines, with Kitabat you've got more than four lines. You could, here it's, it's six lines. It could be a complete uh, a poem by a poet. You could, you could write it like that. Then of course they, you, have the, uh, uh, you have the Katiba, which is really large, which is big, and it's used in, in, in monuments. You could put it in, in buildings and mosques and different kinds of places. And it is produced on, uh, on, on tiles, on bricks, which is, which is really big. The other style is, of course, what you produce with seals. You want to put people's names on a steel. And this is usually done again by a calligrapher. It's, it's not so easy to, to actually produce. So you see there's a very, uh, uh, the, the range of, of kind of calligraphy that you do is, is, is infinite, if you like. Now, the learning and teaching part of it is, is very interesting. This is again a FCR mash by Bezogol and Zas is at Al Khatum Achfiyon Vita Alim al Ustad, La Tavamu Vita Vam al Mash, the test of the mash. So the calligraphy is, is hidden in the way that your teacher instructs you how to do it. And then you have you've got to keep practicing it. So is it possible on your own? Yes, it is not impossible. Many people have done it. I have done it. You can make progress if you really uh, devote a lot of time on it. You can, you can learn things. But at the end of the day, it is something like spiritual practice. You always need a teacher, somebody who closely advises you on how to do the nitty gritty things of, of, of the business. Uh, this is, I've, I've, I've put that term deliberately. The ta'aleem is really critical here. It's, it, it really significantly helps the progress of somebody who wants to do calligraphy. But it only works best when you've got access to a living present teacher. I could look at the works of Mirza Ola Mirza or Mirza or anybody else in the past. 
but there is a fundamental difference from between what I learned from the person that I could actually physically see and something that I see in the workings of Mirza Walamza. It doesn't really help that much. And once you actually experience it, you will see that the, it's, it's the kind of progress that you make is astronomically different. It changes, fundamentally changes. You could visibly see it. As soon as you, you experience a teacher, even for 10 minutes, if you're exposed to a teacher to tell you what to do, before and after it is not comparable. So I, I wouldn't emphasize any more the significance of a, of a living teacher. Now, of course, you can learn online these days. You could have it on Zoom. You could have it on, on different kind of social media. People make videos, but still, it's not like a physically accessible thing. So it is not impossible, but of course, if you really have the passion, not if, or, or as she said, you have a lot of time on your hands, and not everybody has that. So what do you learn? First of all, the techniques of how to create and handle the curves which are the basic things, and then gradually you'll make progress in them. Then you produce graphically beautiful and aesthetically impressive uh, words. I mean, you can write something and then they say, wow, what have I produced? And you enjoy it. But then, of course, a couple of weeks later, or a few years later, you look back at it, oh, what, a, <laughs> what a, an embarrassing thing. You, you feel embarrassed. But when you go along, you will see how, how you, you've made that progress. So harmony is critical. With Nasari, the most, um, with any kind of art, to say it like that. Harmony is fundamentally important. You need to internalize the right proportions. You don't do it with a ruler. You do it, and not, not just even with your eyes and your hands. It happens in your brain. It happens in your mind. So what you have here is mathematics, of course. You have art mathematics. Well, I'm, I'm referring to the, to the golden ratio. The golden ratio is also very important in, 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 in calligraphy. Then you've got art, you've got esotericism, you've got gnosis, and I'll explain what I mean by esotericism and gnosis here. Spacing is critical. You cannot too put too, too many uh, long spaces between letters and words. Everything has got to be neatly done. It has to be uh, harmonious. So your hand, your body, your eyes, your mind and your eyes need to be trained. Then you would have to write, use the right distance between your eye and the paper usually between 30 to 40 centimeters is the distance between your eyes and paper when, when you're writing. You've got to choose the right size of the pen, of course. If your pen is too big, it's, it's not going to help. And if the, the pen is carved in, uh, not in proportion with the size of your fingers, again, you're going to have trouble. Which is why those of you who have given the pen, you can see it, but uh, you can check it against the size of your thumb, and it, it could be different. Because if, if, if it's stiff like that, you can still do it, but it, it gives you a hard time. So in early stages, they use the average size of, of practice pens, which is two to six millimeters, which is exactly the, the length of, 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 the, of, of the tip of the, of the pen. So the next level has to do with language. This is where language practically comes in. So it is done often with poetry, generally, in, in, uh, at least in the Persian uh, side of it. In Arabic, you see verses of the Quran, you see prayers, etc. So the Persian poetry, which is still very vibrant today, is part of what you do in, in, in calligraphy and it guides you. And it carry, it's a carrier of wisdom. And uh, you, you see a lot of mysticism in it, you see art in it, you see love in it, you see imagination in it, you see life in it, but of course, most importantly, you see wisdom in it. So everything that, you, that a calligrapher writes, they don't write swear words with, with calligraphy. They usually write something which is meaningful, which is important for the uh, for the for the uh, progress and development of human beings, so it is a propeller of wisdom, if you like. Then you've got the music of sounds and letters. It sounds odd because there's no sound, physical sound, with the letters, but you have to feel it. So they have their own music. So the more harmonious and the delicate the curves are, the more appealing they look, and you could hear them. You could look at the curves and the letters, and it's as if you're dancing with it. Now, this is why there is an association between Nasali and music. It's very interesting that many people in, 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 in the, at least in the history of Muslim Iranians, who do Nastali, they also have a taste in music. The, the famous great master of, of Iranian music, Shahzad Riyan, who recently died, he was also a master calligrapher in Nastali. He didn't do it for a long time, but all of them are kind of closely connected with one another. So the curves are the key thing. This is, this is the higher level of, of the mastery of, of, of calligraphy. This is, again, another uh, by Mirza there is a, a part of a verse by Rumi, he's referring to the Prophet. 
So whenever he wanted just to, to relax in his, the, the sophistication of his spiritual practice, he would speak with his wife. He would ask his wife to come and talk to him. He would talk to Aisha, Kaldimini, or Mustafa Muhammad, the Saudat Hamdani, and to Aulam Master Goftash Mishadi, Kaldimini, or Homeiran. So you see how all these themes uh, penetrate uh, the, the art of calligraphy. So you've got curves in the nature, you've got curves in art, and you've got curves in love. I'm using it very carefully, by the way, I teach love in the sense that people fall in love in different places in the human world. And uh, people just don't fall in love with straight geometric lines. The curve is very much important. So letters have their music too, they've got their own curves. So uh, uh, in the letters, you've got these harmonious uh, curves that they call door or daire. So you see it in letter nun, you see it in letter ya, you see it in lam, you see it in all kinds of he and he and rain and things like that, which is, which is, um, if, if you're doing calligraphy, once you really manage to do this part of it well, it means that now you're really making significant progress in, in, in calligraphy. This is where nostalgia gets closely connected with music. That is where you've actually discovered the musical letters. So the cruising level is here when you actually begin to master the uh, curves correctly. Uh, so when you observe the right slant in the elongations and the kashitas and the mats, and then you manage to compose, to move different words in different locations, not in just a straight line. The, the location, the composition of the letters is particularly important. And the way you set the letters and in perfect harmony, that is the next stage, they call it tarkit. So the stages of calligraphy is, of course, the Hosn Tashki, the beauty of formation, how you put the words together, where you put the elongations, because you cannot just put the elongation in the beginning of, of, the, of the sentence. It has to be somewhere towards the end. There's, there's, there's a priority of where you could actually put the mat or the kashita. Then we've got the beauty of this position. They call it Hosn Vahanspeta. The highest level is what they call dignity and uh, refinement, Sha'an and Safa. So, when you read the, the, when you look at the calligraphy of a master calligrapher, there is something that you just, you don't even need to know the language. Just look at it and you enjoy it. It's aesthetically very good, just beautiful. That's what they call shan and sapo. And of course, it's not for people like me. It, it takes time. You, you have to spend years until you reach that level. So this is, this is like, like a, a mystical, uh, spiritual progress and enlightenment. You, in order to do that, you need to spend time. So this is uh, a, a, a poem by Mirali Harabi. So he gives the details of how you become a calligrapher. He just gives you five conditions. I think it's a little bit setting the, the bar too high, but it, it, it suggests something. He says that you spend your precious moments of your life in the field of calligraphy, so let me give you a piece of advice and then you can relax. There are five things you need to become a, uh, to become a calligrapher without the combination of all these. It is impossible to become a calligrapher. That's where he's exaggerating a little bit, but there's, there's wisdom in it. You need to have a fine taste, because not a, a rough person cannot really get into calligraphy. You, you, you need to have that kind of uh, fine taste with you. Then you've got to know the techniques. Of course, you need to learn, you need to read, you need to learn from your teacher. You need to have a strong hand. If your hand is physically incapable of holding the pen properly, and then generally everybody is, uh, has got that ability. If you're a uh, physically able human being, you can do it. And then you need to have endurance, so you have to spend time on it, and a complete set of writing tools, because it has to be all, all those tools that I gave you, you need to have them all with you. And over time, you will learn how to do it. If any one of these five falls short, it will be a futile job, even if you try for 100 years. So that's over. So if you've got any questions, it's time to ask now.